Hello, everyone. My name is Marco Bortoleto, uh, member of the FAG Education Commission. At the last three years, the International Gymnastics Federation has made an important effort to expand its education actions. In this way, the dissemination of quality knowledge through, through online seminars open to the entire community seems to us a strategy that can contribute to the future of gymnastics. I'm delighted to present the second online seminar in 2022, which explores the urgent needs to redefine sport coaching education based on contemporary perspectives. Our guest today is an outstanding scholar of sport who has spent more than 40 years acting as a coach, scientist, and university professor. He is currently a professor and associate dean of research at Cardiff Metropolitan University in Wales and a visiting professor at both the University of Malaysia and the Western Norway University of Applied Science. Much of the work done by him have been focused in reconceptualized coaching as a social activity, focusing on such issues as interaction, compliance, and power as related to athletes' learning. He has published widely on coaching and coach education, including 13 books and over 80 academic and 20 professional practice papers. So welcome, Professor Dr. Robin Jones. Well, thank you very, very much, Marco, for the invite to come and, and to share some thoughts with you all. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it very much. Thank you. It's our pleasure. We know how much time you spent in studying this topic, and we really want to see your presentation today. So feel free, take the floor and go ahead. Firstly, I'd just like to thank you for the invite to come to speak with you and to really can share some thoughts about how we should be rethinking or reimagining something that we do perhaps without much thought. That is how we educate a coaches in the job that they do, which is really about the improvement of athlete performances. And I say that because many of us don't really think through what am I trying to do here as a coach and as an educator? And the second question is, I don't think we ask enough, is uh, can I think imaginatively, so-called outside of the box, about how we do this in a better way? So I'm going to try to somewhat address these two issues in what I'm going to say here. So as a plan of what I want to say, the first thing that I want to explore and to arrive at perhaps, is the essence of what are we trying to educate about? So if we think that the essence of coaching is athlete learning, how are we ensuring the best we can that this is happening? So once we agree about what the essence of uh, uh, um, coaching actually is, then we can start to think about how we educate for it. And here, I'd like to say just a little about the work that we do here in Wales, really about this issue of a coach edu education, as well as a reason for why we do it in this way and maybe, and maybe not in any other. I then go on to maybe speak and present about a couple of examples about how this actually works in practice. Now, the first relates to how we think and reflect with the emphasis here on the inferential, the kind of forward thinking reflection and not the backward thinking that we're usually engaged in as coaches. And the second is to do really with observation. Now, this is something that we do an enormous amount as coaches, but not, I believe, in a particularly insightful way. And finally, this goes to educating about a desired identity in terms of who do you want to become as a coach? 
Thus, we need to give a bit more room and space for individual agency. So initially, what is coaching really about? Well, there is plenty of research now that locates the job that we do as coaches as both social and relational. What is meant by this is that it happens within a particular social environment with many different actors involved, and each with his or her own agenda. So although no doubt there are some overall agreements here about what ought to be done, what is seen to work in one environment is no guarantee that it will work in another. So there are many kind of situational factors to think about and consider. And as a result of this recognition, there has been an increasing move away from such rather simplistic, maybe naive notions as empowerment, certain actions and behaviors which are recommended, or even athlete centeredness as being at the heart of what we do really with athletes. So there is plenty of evidence out there now that what a coaching is really about is exerting influence over others. Now, how this is done, how it is accepted, and the relationships established within the environments are absolutely vital. Now, this is not to say that it's not about the sport. As inside, as inside out knowledge of your particular sport as a coach is absolutely vital. But I could know my sport exceptionally well, but it doesn't mean I can make others learn or excel within that sport. It's a different job altogether. Now, this idea of influencing others is not always easy for some as they think that influencing or controlling others is an exclusively some negative thing. But this is not done in some dark scheming way, but rather is simply viewed as a social strategy we all use every day in a variety of ways to realize our set objectives, usually with the best interests of athletes at heart, if we're coaches. So how is this influence or control established? Again, from really a lot of research out there, it is done through trying to support others in terms of learning and social support for athletes. It's also done in trying to develop a sense of obligation in others, often as a result of the support I just mentioned. And through um, a similar um, recognition or awareness that there is always an exchange that's going on here. There's a joint responsibility for the athlete's improvement I mentioned. So if a coaching is about relationships and influencing others, how should we educate those that do the job? At the university I work with at Cardiff Met, we have taken the following approach. We educate not about the sport itself. Coaching is not particularly about the sport and, and neither is it some form of applied sports science, which we can easily get or even read in a book. And hence, we don't have any ready-made answers. Although and really, although those we speak to often want such things, coaches would like such things very often. But rather, our emphasis is to educate uh, and coaches to really think about what they already know, why they know it, and importantly, how they can develop some imaginative thinking in relation to that knowledge. And so, therefore, they can advance that knowledge base. And here I cite some interesting support. Okay, I may have added one word here, of course, and Einstein, he didn't work in sport as we know, and certainly wasn't a gymnast. 
but the sentiment here, I'm sure that you can relate to. It is not the learning of facts that's vital, but the working and training of the mind to actually kind of think about what you know and what you want to know. So this is the approach we take to educate coaches. Okay, as I said that we do uh, um, quite a bit of consultancy work with national and international organizations and sporting organizations. And this is the slide I give to those in those sessions or workshops that we run for coaches. Because I believe that none of us are empty vessels waiting to be filled up, because otherwise you just get a one size can fit all and maybe a reproduction of practice. So in these workshops, uh, um, coaches have to be very active, <coughs> excuse me, like in their learning. And so I insist that they're active learners. So their work here is to imagine some of the ideas that we give them into their everyday world. Always asking, what can this look like for you? They also have to think a little bit more about what they say and do, because everything you say and do as a coach, everything matters. And lastly, they have to be adventurous, not reckless, but adventurous. So they have to experiment at the edge of what they already know as coaches, and thus invite a degree of failure in what they do. And I just want to expand a little on that now. Now, I'm not speaking about reckless or maybe unthought through actions here. And echoing what I said earlier, can a such thoughts need to be thought through in terms of what do I want to happen? Is there another way? And I, and I really want to emphasize that I'm not speaking about risking athletes kind of safety and well-being here, but maybe experimenting with a different explanation of things, a different way of thinking about a familiar concept. And so rather than seeing success and failure as we usually do, like as opposites, I think this can be reframed in terms of really seeing success and failure as going along the same route. Indeed, logically, you can't have one without the other. So in this respect, I think that failure should not always be looked upon as a bad thing as it should make you explore all sorts of other ways. And the first example of this sort of material I want to give is that of forward and backwards thinking. Now, usually in all the coach education courses that we're obliged to go on, there is an element or a request to reflect. Now, this is not a bad thing that's in and of itself. However, almost exclusively, the emphasis is on the backwards thinking. That is, on what has already happened in a largely explanatory or an evaluative way. But forwards thinking, on the other hand, speaks to the inferential or imaginative thought. That is, on the basis of this evidence, I wonder if that would actually work. Of course, this speaks to being adventurous and brave in what you do as a coach, something I mentioned earlier. So looking at this in a little bit more in depth, looking backwards is really about trying to understand and maybe evaluate what has happened. So we have reflection in action, we have reflection on action, and we also have and we also have what's called retrospective reflection on action, which is just looking back over a block of work you've done as a coach or maybe a season review. And this is often framed in terms of an evaluation of did something work, and then searching for an explanation of why or maybe why not. And so in essence, really, this is a way 
of raising awareness, of making somebody aware, of recognizing it. Although it does have some value, it is nevertheless rooted in examining what we already know, and therefore it does not make anything new. The thinking forwards, on the other hand, requires another set of skills or attributes. And this, at the moment, I believe, is something we largely, excuse me, we largely ignore as coach educators. Now, this relates to actually thinking, what can I do next on the basis of what do I already know? And surprisingly, maybe it's heavily linked with observation and also making sense of those observations, which are imaginative acts in and of themselves. It is, of course, linked to where do I want to go or what do I want to do here so that you can see that the thinking is very forward in nature. So this kind of reflection really speaks to inference and to imagination. What can you refer or infer from what you already know? And what can you imagine a different future, perhaps? Now, within these kind of sessions that we run for coaches, we always input a number of these things. Perception breaks, where the larger group is broken up into kind of smaller ones or even on one-on-ones and pairs. Here, the big emphasis is on thinking with, with a new idea, not just thinking on experience and what I already know. So, but to an extent, you can see how the forward thinking emphasis is made to live really within the sessions that we give to coaches. What these actually are, like in essence, okay, the perception breaks, are a chance for individual sense making within a social environment. And this kind of follows the learning theories of Lev Vygotsky in many ways, where thoughts about how can I make sense of this idea in my own environment are engaged with. And this is the part of the work that they're really involved in and expected of them. And here also, I always ask the audience to make notes and to write things down to be revisited later, perhaps erased or expanded upon or kind of followed up with individual readings. But they have to leave each kind of session with some kind of writings. So the second example that I want to give you here is that of seeing or noticing. Now, if you really think about it, like observing or noticing, is the thing that we are perhaps more involved in than anything else as coaches. After the management of the session, the instruction, the advice, and then the feedback, what do we then do? We largely, we observe. But hardly anybody speaks about really about observation in terms of what are you seeing as a coach? And why are you seeing that and not something else? Now, the work of John Mason is quite interesting here, who wrote a book called The Discipline of Noticing. And here that Mason argues that we should be more aware and sensitive to the needs of the moment of exactly what is happening here within my environment and why, usually related to the athlete's performances. So he argues it is to be rigorous, but not rigid within our observations. So he's asking us not to rigidly only look for certain things in the sessions that we run, because you might miss really kind of some things that are equally or more important. So in this respect, you need to take care with your thinking about what am I looking for here? Again, within the sessions that you run as coaches. As if you're rigid, you will probably see what you are looking for, but, but at the expense of what else?
So this goes to the even more kind of fundamental issue and question of what is an observation? And do we ever ask really our coaches about how often do you reflect and think about what you actually see whilst you're coaching? And here, the work of the sociologist Niklas Luhmann comes into the fore and his social theory of observation. Here, he argued that observation is a social act in that the observer has to see something as opposed to something else. Usually then there is something that is drawn into the foreground while other things are relegated into the background. But of course, according to Luhmann, you can only see something that you can recognize or identify. Hence, in seeing something, like in a sporting session, for example, says more about you as a coach, what you value, what you're looking for, and what you already know than the actual thing that you've seen itself. So for example, what do you see here in this reversible image? Well, there's an old woman here, but there's also a young woman, really with the message that there's always more things in the environment than what is first seen. And in addition, the other message is that there is always more ways of looking at the same, um, excuse me, at the same event and making sense out of the same event. We thus, within the sessions that we run, coach education sessions that we run, we encourage of coaches to take care with their seeing and not to rush to judgments and to also think about and consider why they see one image first and not the other, why the old lady first and not the young, or maybe vice versa. Were they somehow perhaps led by what they expected to see, or maybe uh, uh, by what they thought they ought to see? And so for Luhmann then, there are always, within a context, there are always going to be visible things and non-visible things. Now these non-visible things are not invisible, they are non-visible in that you, as a coach, have somehow made a decision and selected not to see them or to put value on them. As a coach then, what we should be trying to find is not just a newness or more information or seeing more things, but trying to identify what is, what is the difference that makes the difference to what I'm trying to do within this session. And this again goes to the consensus making and the critical thinking abilities of the coach. Of course, it's then, it's not enough just to see more in your environment as a coach. There has to be another step, and this step is interpretation. You then have to make sense of what you've seen in order that you get to the difference that makes the difference. So you have to explain, usually to yourself and then others maybe, what is the meaning of this observation for my practice going forward. So in essence, what you're trying to do here, what you're involved in, is trying to figure out what has been observed, what do I see, and then again, how does that relate to what I do and what I want to do as a coach. Interpretation then is, is, is a means of of moving observations into meaning in order, of course, that they can help to future action. So what much of this uh, um, critical thinking agenda is all about for coaches? 
is to make them think in all sorts of new alternative ways about what they already know, and in particular, their sport-specific knowledge. Now, some um, coaches can feel that an emphasis is this, where they have to think imaginatively about what they have to do is very hard. After all, it's not quite what they expect or what they are used to on courses like this. So this idea that they are somewhat responsible for their own development and that we are who we are from the outside in, that is from our evolving experiences is not so easy to accept for some. But we have found that if it's explained and made accessible for coaches, then most, if not all of the information will be absorbed. It will land on them either sooner or maybe later. And then once they accept this, this responsibility and to various extents and degrees, of course, they can further think about such issues not simplistically about what works and doesn't work for me as a coach, but what do I want to be known for as a coach? Leading then to who do I want to become as a coach? So on that, I would just once again like to say kind of thank you very, very much for the opportunity to come to record this and uh, and I hope, uh, I hope that you've experimented uh, and I hope that this made you think about your practice in coaching. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for this wonderful presentation. The insights you bring are so many that I believe I will have to watch your presentation several times. Since we still have some minutes, I would like to ask two questions if you don't mind. Of course, of course, yes, I look forward to it to having a discussion, because learning is all about the discussion and the sense-making. Based on the critical thinking you just presented, and also in your experience as a coach and as an educator, what strategies would you recommend for coach education programs to approach the social and relational perspective that you defend? Well, I think one of the first things that we need to really think about is that much of the research and much of what we know about how coaches learn to come from informal means. This, this is what the information that we have. I'd like, however, to emphasize that has to go hand in hand with more formal means of learning education. So I think we underdo the kind of formality but in order for that to happen and to have relevance, it needs to be reconceptualized a little bit because it shouldn't be about the sport, like as I've already said, it shouldn't be about the sport, but in how you inspire the learning of the sport in others. They are not the same thing. So I think the first thing is to understand that and then to get a bit more kind of formality like in relation to thinking with things. It's with new notions, not just on, not just on experience. So this is how you drive things forward. And the other thing I want to emphasize here is that I don't think that isolated workshops really work. I think um, coaches find them very interesting, but then they go back and they have the everydayness of life and they just can't fit the theory into the practice. So this has to happen over maybe 18 months with lots of, of mentorship and support like around the new knowledge like and the development of coaches. So the formality and then the wraparound support, really that's how maybe you alter the learning of coaches. So that's the interesting point because we, we are facing a big challenge concerning coaching education and many people are really disappointed or sometimes they are not really believe and we can change and we can have better future but uh, listen what you say I, I'm sure we can really uh, work more and in the future change the quality of the coach uh, actions in the form sport. so thank you very much for this 
uh, understanding. My second question, it's about tradition. So in a traditional sports with a long history like gymnastics, changes are always difficult. So what experience have you been carrying out that have actually changed the work and the way we think about coaches and coaching education? Um, traditions are very interesting, I think, Marco, because we can learn a lot kind of, from them. There are some wonderful things in traditions, but sometimes we become a, something of um, a prisoner to our history. So we have to make sure that we value what's valuable about it and good about it, but also to think about where we can improve it. So how to influence uh, um, how to influence an organization, a coach education organization or a national sporting governing body is very difficult, but it's a political process. I think that we have to work at that level. We have to access the kind of stakeholders who are influential and we have to try to win them over. Exactly the same thing is happening in here right now, I guess. We have to try to win them over and to show the value of the work for the guys that they will be working with and educating them. So you have to establish your relationships. And as I said, you have to show the value of what you're doing and believe in what you're doing, like in order that you then can have kind of some influence, like over these very, very influential individuals, the gate the keepers, if you like, of coach education knowledge. So it's not easy, but it's a political thing and we can all work in that way. So thanks. I, I do believe it, it is possible in the future. And as you said, it's a long-term process, changing takes time, but uh, together combine the experience we have uh, in different sports, but also inside of gymnastics. I, I'm sure we can really make in the future uh, coaches acting uh, very differently and according to the expectation we have in our times. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jones, for this wonderful conversation and presentation. I hope our community enjoy very much uh, this seminar. I just want to say once again, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to come to speak and to share some thoughts and to explore some new notions with you at the FIG. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. So thank you again, Dr. Jones, and thank you, the International Gymnastics Federation, especially the Education Department. I think the gymnastics community uh, should take the chance to visit the FAG Education channel at YouTube, where we have much more interesting seminars. Thank you, the entire community. And uh, I recommend everyone to keep visiting the FAG web and social media to access the other seminars that will be published soon. Thank you and goodbye.